In this class, I will be dealing with enforcement of patent rights. And in the, in the context of enforcement of patent right, I will also discuss that what relevance the patent search plays in enforcement of patent. Now, once the patent right is granted, the patent as we know, we have seen that patentee becomes entitled to the rights which are mentioned in section 48 of the patent act. And those are the rights of the patentees and if anyone does anything which has the potential, which makes a potential damage to his or her right, the question of enforcement arises. Now, to be very precise, uh, enforcement of patent right, it can be enforced in two different ways. First of all, it can be enforced by the court, which is which we will call the judicial, enfor judicial enforcement of patent. And then it can also be enforced through administrative measures. And when you talk about judicial enforcement of patent, the main instrument, the main actually methodology of enforcement of patent is by, by filing infringement suit against the person who has infringed the rights of the patent holder. And there are two additional what kind of suits which can also be filed and therefore, we can group it under the infringement suit. They are called the declaratory suit and suits against a groundless threat. In this class, mainly I will be focusing on infringement suit and administrative measure which is also known as the border measure. Now, let me start with the administrative measure first and then I will be discussing about infringement suit. Now, the question why administrative enforcement of patent is something which is actually which is related which we call border measure. Border measure means before an infringed article enters the market from the border from the port the administrative authority, they do have the power to stop that good and, and they can disallow that article to enter into the market. And therefore, since the step is taken at the border itself, therefore, we call it border measure. By now, we know about the TRIPS agreement and TRIPS agreement uses this term border measure. Now, what is the border measure? We will look into this. Here, in order to understand the border measure, we have to look into the Customs Act and section 11 of the Customs Act is the most important provision in this regard and it talks about what you call border measure and we will see the relevant provisions, the re relevant sub clauses of section of clause 1 of section 11. And as you can see in your screen, it says that if the central government is satisfied that it is necessary to do so, to do for any of the purposes specified in subsection 2, it may by notification in the official gazette prohibit either absolutely or subject to such conditions to be to be fulfilled before or after the clearance as may be specified in the notification, the import or export of goods of any specified dis description. Now, the question is this that prohib the central government by this section is empowered to prohibit the entry of a article in India for the purposes which have been referred in subsection 2. Now, in this regard, the most important subsections are subsection N, which talks about protection of patents, trademarks and copyright and subsection U, which is a general subsection, which talks about the prevention of the contravention of any law for the time being in force. So, subsection N is very specific and it 
it talks about patents, it talked up, talks about what you call protection and for protection of patents, it talks about protection of trademarks and it also talks about protection of copyrights. Whereas, the sub subsection u is a general sub subsection is a clause which says that prevention anything which is contrary to the laws in force in India, the central government can take measure to prohibit absolutely or subject to such condition the entry export import or export of that goods. Now, what has happened that pursuant to this act as back as in 2007, a kind of uh, what you call an administrative declare uh, a, a kind of rule was announced and this actually this was done pursuant to subsection 1 of section 156 of the customs act. And this rule is known as the intellectual property rights imported goods enforcement rules of 2007. Now, what it says that it, it first of all so rule 2 b of the rule it defines intellectual property and that definition which was created in 2007 in the intellectual property enforcement rule included uh, patent. And then again there is a def the, there is a definition who is a right holder and that definition again which has been given in rule 2 d of which was given in rule 2 d of the intellectual property rights and imported goods enforcement rule it says that right holder has to give notice to the commissioner of customs or any other authorized customs officer at the port of import of the goods so this was to prevent the import of counterfeit goods which are which are infringing patent rights or which is infringing trademark right or which is infringing copyright. Now, <clears throat> what it says actually we will we'll look what what it used to say at that particular point of time we will look into this. What has happened in 2007 when this rule was created this rule actually contained definition of intellectual property and also it contained definition of the term intellectual property laws. Now, uh, as you can see that rule 2 b of the rule at which was enacted in 2007, it says that intellectual property means copyright, it includes trademark and it also includes actually patent as defined in patent right. In, in Patent Act of 1970. Furthermore, Rule 2 C also says that intellectual property law includes patent right. So, therefore, the 2007 rule as it stood at that particular point of time, it permitted a person to ask the custom officer to what you call prevent the entry of a patent of an article which is infringing his patent right. Then what has happened in 2008 to sorry in 2018 this rule was amended and after amendment as you can see in your screen uh, from rule 2 b patent as defined in patent act has been dropped and again in rule 2 c the word the patent act 1970 has been dropped. To be very precise, after the amendment of 2008, patent is not a part of the intellectual property rights imported goods enforcement rule. So, does it mean that today a patent owner cannot actually ask the custom officer to debar entry of a good or an article which is infringing his or her patent. So, this is actually the moot legal question. So, in this regard, first of all we have to understand the international law in this regard. The international law which is embodied in article 51 of the TRIPS agreement, which says which does not make that patent is not a part of article 51. It says that actually it is, it is the, the, the mandate is for in, is in respect of counterfeit trademark good and pirated copyright goods, but not a mandate in respect of patent. However, it is optional for the members 
if the members they feel that the WTO members they feel that uh, it should be it should be also extended to other forms of intellectual property including patent in that case they can do so, but the 2007 rule was something which is TRIPS plus obligation. See we under the TRIPS agreement we do not have an obligation which is more than what is the basic minimum standard prescribed by the TRIPS agreement and the 2007 rule which actually included a, included patent. Moreover, the parent act which is the customs act of 1962 also included patent. So, under the TRIPS agreement we do not have an international obligation to include patent within the scope of the border measure. Now, the here the question comes you have already gone through the procedures of patent search and the the role which patent search plays in, in, in the patent scenario we you have already seen. But the question is this that whether a custom official who is working in the in the port of entry whether is he competent to understand whether the patent which is being claimed by the by the patent owner whether that patent is valid or whether actually the article which is basically awaiting entry into the domestic market whether that article is infringing patent. To be very precise we are we are completely aware that only a patent examiner or a patent attorney or a patent lawyer arguing a case before the court he or she must be having the competence to understand the technicalities and in addition to the uh, in addition to technicality he or she has the competence to look into the validity of the patent and to what extent the product coming from others are infringing the patent. The custom officials they do not have the expertise nor they are required to have that expertise and therefore, it is wrong to leave it to a custom officer to basically determine the patent validity of the patent and as well as determine whether the good which is awaiting entry the article which is awaiting entry is violating the rights of the patent holder. Now, the domestic law uh, as we you can see in screen does does have does not have any provision for better border measure whereas, the copyright act see domestic patent law if we if we compare copyright law with the with the uh, patent law we will find that in the copyright act there is a provision that is section 53 which also talks about border measure. Whereas, in, in case of patent act you will not find a kind of uh, collateral provision rather than patent act does not talk about border measure. And the border measure in respect of patent was the, has been created by the 1962 customs act and which has been further. Uh, actually elaborated in the form of what you call uh, the intellectual property import rules of 2000 uh, uh, sorry import rules of 2007. Now, with this regard now what is the situation? The situation is actually uh, what we have seen that the patent act the patent act is actually giving us the right which says that a patent as we you can see from section 48 of the patent act the patent holder the right holder he has the right to prevent importing of the patented article patented for the purpose of if it is a product patent he has the right to stop basically he has the exclusive right to import that prevent others from importing the good the article embodying the patent into the market. In, and this substantive right is also recognized in the Customs Act of 1962, which says that actually for the purpose of you, the the uh, the patent holder has the right as the as the is allowed to ask the custom official to stop uh, at the border an article which is likely to infringe patent. Now, uh, section 11. A is actually it, it, it says that illegal import means import of any good in contravention of this provision or any other law for the time being in force. 
So, there are two provisions here. On one hand, the Patent Act actually has created a substantive right in favor of the patent, uh, patent holder and that substantive right can also can be enforced under the relevant provisions which you can see under the Customs Act. Now, what has happened? The Parent Act is there, but the, subs, the rules which have been created under the Parent Act does not talk about patent anymore. So, what would be the effect? The possible interpretation is this that a patent holder can seek a court order, he can go to court, he has to seek a court order and by that court order he would be actually seeking a direction on the custom officials not to release the product uh, from, the, from, 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 the, from, the, from the warehouse where the product has come. So, the rule is not supporting the parent act. However, the substantive provision still remains in the patent act and therefore, the possible interpretation would be that even today a patent holder can stop a infringing article from entering into the market by asking the court to pass an appropriate order directing the pet custom official to not to release that good in the market. So, this is all about the what you call the administrative measure with regard to the patent enforcement. And here what we have seen that when this issue comes up before the court, a, see a patent holder can do it in two ways. A patent holder can file an infringement suit before the court and then in, in, in relation to that infringement suit, the plaintiff that, that is the patent holder, he can seek an order under 151 of civil procedure code requesting asking the court to stop the custom officials from granting from releasing the article for into the domestic market. Furthermore, it can also be possibly be a, an action under uh, article 226 of the constitution whereby uh, the patent holder would be seeking a uh, writ of mandamus against the custom officials and there if the, if the court is satisfied, the court would be passing a writ of mandamus directing the custom officials not to uh, release that good into the domestic market. Now, we will come to the core issue of judicial enforcement uh, and in this regard first we will be dealing with suits concerning infringement of patent right. And uh, what is infringement? What constitutes infringement of patent? Now, infringements the, the infringement to be very precise is a legal term which means violation of the legal right. And in the context of patent it means that violation of the legal rights, the rights in name which have been granted to the patent holder under section 48 of the Patent Act. Now, in, in our patent law, we do not have a definition of infringement. If you look into the Copyright Act, we do have a specific definition of what is copyright infringement. That is section 51 of the Copyright Act tells us that what constitutes copyright infringement. But if we look into the Patent Act, we will not find a, st a kind of corresponding provision which tells us that what is patent infringement. Uh, therefore, the question comes up in that case actually if the patent infringement has not been defined, does it mean that violation of any of the rights which are mentioned in section 48 would be a patent infringement and this is by implication. But we can look into the statutes of other common law countries. For example, we can look into the, stat the US patent statute and there you will find a specific section that is section 271 of the US patent act which deals with what you call patent infringement. Now, uh, here what I have, I have done in the screen itself you can see that 271 I have quoted. And in two, what we can see that patent can be infringed in three different ways from this definition. Number one, it can be an infringement, direct infringement. It can also be an indirect or secondary infringement in the form of contributory infringement 
or it can also be an infringement by inducement and all these provisions are embodied in section 271 of the U.S. Patent Act. Now, whenever a, a suit is filed from a lawyer's point of view, the first question is this that the who are the relevant parties to a suit? We know that if actually if we do not add the relevant parties to the suit, if we do not implete the proper defendants in a suit, the suit will fail. Now, who are the parties? Who are who can be a plaintiff in a infringement patent infringement suit is the first question. There is no doubt that the person who is the right holder, the person who is the patentee, he has the he can file a patent infringement suit, there is no doubt about that. In addition to that, we have specific provisions in the patent tag, which makes it possible for others also to file a suit for enforcement of patent. Number one, in addition to that, an exclusive licensee and who is an exclusive licensee? Exclusive licensee is a person who has got an exclusive license and that exclusive licensee has the right to file a, a patent infringement suit and, and if the patentee, if the right holder has not joined the, the suit as a plaintiff, in that case section 109 of the patent act says that the patent holder who has given an exclusive license to someone else, that when that someone else is filing the suit, the patent holder if he is not joining as defendant, he has to be made a defendant in that suit. Here the question comes that in that does it mean that when the patent holder is not joining and the exclusive licensee is filing a suit for enforcement of patent or infringement of patent, uh, is, he, is he a pro, pro, pro forma defendant or is he not a pro forma defendant? On this issue, this is an open ended debate. But the, what the law says that the defendant must be, he must be made, the patent holder must be made a defendant if he has not joined the suit as plaintiff. In addition to that, anyone who has obtained a compulsory license and this compulsory license is obtained for non-working of the patent which we are aware of. And suppose actually a compulsory license, a person who got a compulsory license, uh, he, he can file a suit. What happens in this case? The compulsory licensee has to first actually uh, uh, ask the patent holder that uh, he that you file a suit because the compulsory license which I am enjoying some is being in, is being infringed by somebody else. To be very precise, we know that the patent holder even after the after the grant of exclusive license or even after the license of actually a compulsory license, the patent holder still remains the owner of the patent for all practicalities. He might not be having any right. Suppose if this is a license which is actually a non revocable worldwide exclusive license. In that case, actually technically the patent holder does not have who technically the patent holder who is basically who has granted the license in the capacity of the licensor, he has no right. But for from the point of view of law, he is a superior title holder, he is the owner of the patent and therefore, he should be made a party to the, to the patent litigation for the purpose of conclusive determinations or determination of the issues which are being litigated. Now, in, in case of compulsory license also, the compulsory licensee is required to send a notice and, and he has to if the after getting that notice, if the right holder, the owner who is the patentee, if he does not initiate any action in that case, the compulsory licensee can file a suit. Now, the second question comes up that okay, once we know that who are the parties to the patent infringement suit, uh, then we have to decide that where the suit has to be filed. See, 
the suit has to be filed in, in the competent court having jurisdiction to try, determine and entertain that suit. So, uh, in this regard the most important provision, there is a clear provision where the suit has to be filed. Section 104 of the Patent Act, it tells us that the suit would be has to be filed in the, in the district court having jurisdiction to try the suit. So, a patent infringement suit can be filed before the district court. However, when the defendant is actually raise, raises a, the counter claim of revocation, in that case the district court loses its jurisdiction. Section 104 of the Patent Act in crystal clear terms makes it explicit that if in the event the defendant to that suit raises the issue of revocation and he raises this issue in the form of a counterclaim, in that case the suit along with the counterclaim shall be transferred to the high court for decision. So, that means a patent infringement suit can be filed in the court of district judge or in in the in the cities where there are city civil courts, it can be filed before the city civil court. But the moment the defendant comes forward, files the written statement, and in the written statement he takes the defence or counterclaim of revocation, the city civil court or the district court loses its jurisdiction. The suit has to be compulsorily transferred to the high court. See. Here there are few points which I want to mention. It is actually a well known fact that invalidity is the major defense in a patent infringement suit and that defense is always taken by the defendant. Now suppose a suit has been filed in the, in the district court and then uh, after one, one year or after two year when the defendant takes the defense of the uh, what you call counterclaim of revocation. After two years, the case moves from the district court to high court and the trial begins de novo at the high court. So, there lies the problem and here we, we know that uh, for, for from the perspective of civil procedure court and as well as from the perspective of the latest patent, the, uh, the high courts say for example, Kolkata high court, it does have original jurisdiction. If an action arises within the territorial limit of the original, ordinary original civil jurisdiction of the high court of Calcutta, in that case the suit can directly be started and initiated in the high court itself. So, it is advisable that wherever there is actually a it is it is it is it is i think it would be practical to file a suit in the ordinary original civil jurisdiction of those high courts and those th th those high courts which does have ordinary original civil jurisdiction so this is what the point is the next point which i will be discussing is actually what is where where it has to be filed in this regard actually uh, I will take you to a provision of civil procedure code and what is the provision? The provision is that a suit can be instituted in three different places. Number one, where the defendant is residing, where the defendant is carrying on business or where the, where the defendant is personally working for gain. And if there are more, more than one defendant, in that case it can be filed, uh, if there are more than one defendant, where any one of such defendant actually resides or carries on business or personally works for gain. But where there are multiple defendant, in that case it is, it is necessary that the permission of the court has to be taken or if the permission of the court has not been taken, in that case the defendants who do not stay or do not carry on business or do not reside in that jurisdiction, they must consent to that. 
in addition to that it can also be filed in the place where the cause of action has wholly or in part has arisen. So, we will take up the issue, we will begin uh, with place of suing in my next class.